Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. Welcome home. Welcome home. That is what we say here at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Sherman, Texas. We are so thrilled to welcome the Reverend Lisa Perkins back from maternity leave, and we welcome you. Let us worship God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. All creation speaks volumes of God's handiwork. Each sunrise proclaims God's faithfulness, and the night reveals the Creator's awe. Without a word being spoken, all creation bears witness to the goodness of the Lord. So, too, may we join in witness with all creation. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be God's signature in the world.
Faced with God's goodness, we recognize our failings. In the knowledge of God's mercy, we dare tell the truth about ourselves and our world. In the confidence of God's children, let us confess our sins. God of compassion and mercy, we are your wounded children. We bring our wounded selves, our divided society, and our broken world, seeking your healing and transforming grace. It is easy for us to point the finger at others, yet we know that we all need your forgiveness. So we lift into your presence today not only the victims of conflicts, but also those we have called enemies. Break down the walls of hatred, distrust, and bitterness, and open a way for us to reach one another in truth and love. Enable us to build a society where all can belong, to share our gifts in mutual respect, and to seek for the new future which you offer us through Jesus the Christ. As far as the east is from the west and the north from the south, no matter how far we walk, the forgiveness and the mercy of the Lord is always a step ahead of us. For in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, through the gift of your word and spirit, we ask more, much more, to learn of you and trust you, to cherish and serve you, to love, worship, and adore you. This is our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. This is our time with the younger church, the young in age and the young at heart. Today is a very big day at Covenant Presbyterian. You know why? Well, in just a few minutes, you're going to hear a voice and see a face that you haven't seen in a while because Pastor Lisa is back. Pastor Lisa took a couple of months off because she had a baby late in the summer. So she and Austin have a new member of their family, Baby Lincoln. Now, Baby Lincoln has parents and grandparents, and probably aunts and uncles and cousins. But this baby has a bigger family too, as all of us do. Baby Lincoln is now a member of our family, the family of believers. You see, Jesus took the definition of family and he made it even bigger. When he talked to people and told them stories, he referred to them as his brothers and sisters. And after him, there was a very wise man named Paul. He came along after Jesus was gone and he started a lot of new churches and he wrote a lot of letters, many of which are in the Bible and we read them today. And he referred again and again to the family of believers, a great big family that consists of all the people that love and follow Jesus. So does that mean that you and I are family? Yep, actually we are. We may not have the same parents, we may not live in the same house, or even the same town. We may never have met each other, but we are family. And we know that this family is so big that there is always someone there for us to help us or to guide us or to pray for us. Whatever we may need, our family is here. At some point later on, maybe after the pandemic is over and baby Lincoln is a little bit bigger, Pastor Lisa and Austin will probably have him baptized in the church. Many of you were baptized. I was baptized. It's a time when the church family comes together and makes promises to that tiny new baby, in this case, baby Lincoln, that they will love him and nurture him and teach him about Jesus in the best way they know. All of us who were baptized have had those promises made when we were babies, and all of us who are in the family of believers, 
have had those promises made to us at one time or another during our lives. We know that we are never alone, that we have our family of believers, and we have Jesus. So this is a very exciting week where we welcome back Pastor Lisa, and we also say welcome to our newest family member, Baby Lincoln. We all look forward to meeting him, don't we? And hopefully that will be soon. But in the meantime, we can pray for Baby Lincoln and for Pastor Lisa and Austin as they settle into their new life together. And as Lisa, Pastor Lisa and Austin learn more and more about Lincoln, and as he grows, he gets bigger and eats more and sleeps more, we can pray that that will be a wonderful experience for all of that family, and later on, for us too, as a family of believers. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for new babies, and we especially thank you for this new baby, baby Lincoln, who we can't wait to get to know. We thank you for Pastor Lisa and Austin and all the adventures that they will have with brand new baby Lincoln. And we thank you that Pastor Lisa is back with us. We look forward to seeing her soon. And we look forward to getting to know them as a family as they grow together. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, beginning in the 33rd verse. This is a well-known parable of Jesus, but one we don't like to often spend time with. It's the parable of the wicked tenants. Let us be attentive to God's living word this morning. So listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. And so they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the most thrilling things Austin and I ever did was go on our honeymoon to Paris. We took a private tour of a vineyard winemaker's cellar in a place called Dijon, France. I had always wanted to see Paris. It was on my bucket list, and we decided that's where we would spend our honeymoon, in the land of love. Paris had a lot to offer us, and moreover, it's just a bullet train ride away, Dijon is, from Paris, about an hour or so, and it makes some of the world's most famous wines. The Bordeaux region is right outside Dijon. Your famous Pinot Noir is right there in Dijon, so we wanted to see it for ourselves, being only an hour away. Being that close, we just couldn't pass up that opportunity, so we booked a private tour. 
So we took our honeymoon in November, and if you know November in Paris, it's rainy, it's cold, and it's dreary. And of course, in a vineyard in Dijon, there are no grapes. It's pruning season, it's winter, it's dormancy, and so the harvest has already come. So we traveled by train, and as we went, we left the city, and hillside upon hillside came to us. Homes and land and agriculture. Looking out the window, you could just see fields and homes here and there. As we approached Dijon, you could see the vineyards for miles and miles. Nothing but sticks built up off the ground at this point in the harvest. But amazingly, just for miles, these vineyards that as far as the eye could see, we found our tour guide and set off to see the hillside and the vineyards and to our winemaker's place. And as we drove, our tour guide was giving us the lowdown on where we are in the winemaking season, the intricacies of each vineyard and how they were different but then also similar. If you looked across the land, it looks all the same, but he said it's further than the truth. He said this vineyard might be worth a million dollars and the vineyard right next to it worth $20. And I said, how can that be? He said, it's the soil, it's the vineyard, it's the winemaker, it all factors in. We learned that the soil at its worst is actually the best for winemaking. We learned that it looks nothing like what's happening on the top as what's happening underneath the soil. And when you're pruning and you're dormant, there is the beginnings of photosynthesis for the next year's winemaking already in process. So what looks to be like nothing's happening is actually a lot happening. We also learned at one point that the Chinese were taking over a chateau in the nearby region of Dijon that had the Dijon community up in an uproar. They had taken major interest in not only the chateau, but the vast amount of vineyard that went along with it. And as you can imagine, that created some conflict, both for the Chinese and for those in Dijon. We made our way to the wine cellar, one of three winemakers we would see that day. We learned that rain can produce the most flavorful wine for an entire year's harvest, and it produces the most fragrant and the most beautiful grapes. If you want a good year, 2012 was a rainy year in France and some of the best wine. We learned that blends are not exactly what you think they are, but they are a combination of two types of grapes. We learned that a varietal wine is one of the same grapes, but two different vineyards. And so you learn all these little intricacies. By the end of the tour, you can imagine our heads were exploding with so much knowledge about grapes and vines and rains and drought and pruning and harvesting and eating and drinking. But the most interesting thing I think we learned on that tour is that a vineyard can be in a family for generations and generations and years and years. Even if the vineyard is not in production, the ownership of having that vineyard is crucial to stay in the family. Which is why there was so much conflict of the Chinese coming in for the chateau and this vast amount of vineyard outside of Dijon. The questions would come from the tour guide. We're not sure they will honor the, the heritage of that family. Will they take that into consideration? Will they monopolize that vineyard and not allow others to come in and use their grapes? Will they honor Dijon and all that we have done in our traditions? Would they come in and spice things up with technology and new techniques that may or may not be good for any of us? Would they decimate the countryside with overproduction and overcare of the soil that had brought so many years of wine? You could hear the anxiety and angst in his voice about what would happen if someone else came in. A care for the land is at the heart of his conflict. You could see it and feel it. A territorialism that is coming to a head for them. There is a sense of territory in our passage today. A landowner had prepared his land for growing and harvesting, protecting his land. The landowner turns it over to the tenants to work, to produce the harvest, entrusting that they will take care of the land as if 
the landowner was actually doing the work. So day after day, the tenants work the land and the vines. They're up at dawn making sure that bugs and pests are not ruining the crop. They're tucking themselves in bed late at night after a grueling day in the sun, pruning and checking each vine. Day after day, this is their mantra. Harvest time is upon them, and here comes the landowner wanting their unworked share of the grapes, the wine to be produced. So the tenants by this time have grown accustomed to believing that the land has been leased to them to work rightfully theirs. Why wouldn't you think that day in and day out your toil in the land, it it must be yours by now. You're putting in all the work, the time, the effort. These are your grapes. And here comes the landowner. And so they protect what's rightfully theirs, they believe, by killing the slave and sending a message to the landowner, this is ours. They beat one, they kill one, and they stone another. Thinking of it perhaps as a fluke, the landowner sends even more slaves than the first time to the same fate by the tenants. No one's going to take their hard work produce from them. Who does this landowner think they are? So the landowner exasperated at all costs of his slaves, says, well, I'll send my own son. Surely this will get their attention. I'm sending my family now. But that, too, did not matter. This land, this produce was theirs, and that landowner is not in charge. But you see, the tenants don't own that land, or and they're not in charge for that matter, but they say, come. Let us kill the heir and get our inheritance. It's rightfully ours, day in and day out. We are the ones working this. They go to all extremes, even murder, to protect their vineyard that was never theirs in the first place. And so the son dies. What will the landowner now do to the tenants? Retribution? Retaliation? That's what we normally would do. And it makes sense to do that. It's my land, my vineyard. You were paid to work it. And what makes you think you own it now? It suggests that the landowner gives them the same fate, death. But the landowner doesn't. I can't help but notice this parable is of the wicked tenants, as it's often called, and maybe a little too close to home. As much as we'd like the slaves or the landowner or even the son in this story to be us, we are the tenants. We've been asked to work this land, yet somehow, well, in the midst of our work, we have assumed ownership of something we have never been in charge of. But we believe we have the right to say who's worthy of living and dying based on their skin color. We believe we are right and they are wrong. We believe COVID is not really a thing because it hasn't affected us directly, and so we don't wear a mask. That's just a hoax. And these little moments add up to the large belief that we are in charge of everything, including this land and your life and my life. We are the rightful owners because we have been here day and night, and Let's be honest, that landowner appears to be a little bit absent, a little bit too far out of reach, which really begs the question of this sermon. Who is in charge here? This may be a shocker to you, but it's not you. It's not us. Who is in charge here is a question I have always loved to ask when I don't know what's going on. I've been to known to ask it when there's a clear sense of who's in charge, but no one is listening to that person. Or I've been known to ask it in just who's in charge here, clearly knowing I am in charge, but wishing someone else was. And I could ask you that question another way this morning if it ruffles your feathers. By what authority or who gave you authority to do these things? It helps to know what these things are. It could be, who gave you the authority to eat that last orange? Who gave you authority to speak to your brother that way? 
who gave you the authority to treat his vineyard as your own with disregard for the owner? That is the question this morning. Who gave the authority and who's in charge here? If you ask the tenants, they would rightfully say themselves, we've done the hard work. But the landowner just had asked them to work the land. Nowhere does it say they won't get the first fruits or that they will be undermined or underpaid. Yet they begin to believe that, so much so that they will kill anyone who tries to take over or get anything they think belongs to them. The tenants' decisions of greed and arrogance and self-interest and disrespect drip through this entire parable. Their decision of authority will cost people their lives, and so do our decisions. Lately, our decisions do drip of greed and arrogance and disrespect and self-interest of others. There's no longer civil discourse in our world. There's no longer empathy and compassion for someone we don't know. There is a tug of war that this is mine and you can't have it, as if we are five-year-olds, or even more deadly, we have almost said to ourselves and each other subliminally, how dare you try to come and take it, because I'll kill you over it. And if you think you're immune to this parable that you are not a wicked tenant, Jesus is talking about the religious elite as the tenants. He's talking about us, church, too. We are greedy. We are arrogant. We're self-interested at times. And we have been known to disrespect each other. And we are abusing our authority. We've fallen trapped to believe that this is our world, that we own the people who come through the doors of our sanctuary, that we can put parameters on people's faith of who's in and who's out. And don't even get me started on how we do this to people in our world and in our environment. We've lost sight that we are not the owners of this vineyard, this world. We are stewards, rather. We've forgotten that everything we've been given as a people, as a church, and a world has been given to us. We've never rightfully owned it. We own nothing truly at all. And perhaps that is the rub with us. All this world was given to us by our Creator to be a steward, and we really deep down just want to own something. And so we'll do it at all costs. Somewhere along the way, somewhere we've claimed this supreme ownership rather than the vocation of a true tenant, which means of caring and tending, safeguarding and cultivating and harvesting and protecting not only the crop, but each other. What perhaps is more obscene is that the tenants are trusted, wholeheartedly trusted by this landowner to do that work. These are insiders, not outsiders. This is not just happenstance. The tenants were chosen for this work, yet we crave that ownership. We crave that power. And the landowner seems so absent, so uninvolved until the harvest and given over to authority to do these tenets with care and so forth. It insults our core sense of entitlement and threats, threatens our identity as consumers, this parable does. It reminds us that it is not all about us and we're not in charge here. Well, how dare that parable do that to us? Doesn't it know who we are? Doesn't it know what we've done? We are here day in and day out, and God seems so far away, so absent in this mindset. It's further from the truth, friends, because when you're a wicked tenant, your vision is narrow. All you look for is the inheritance at all costs. The cost of 3.6 million acres lost in California to wildfire, homes, neighborhood, lives, and jobs all lost. Our focus is so narrow that 12 black lives have been lost that we have at least heard of on the news since the beginning of the year, but we know there's many more than that. So narrow is our focus as the wicked tenants 
over one million lives lost to COVID because how dare you ask me to wear a mask? How is that ownership really working out for us? You see, it's World Communion Sunday, and the landowner has come to ask about the harvest. I can't help but think how we live in this illusion that we own this earth, that we own everything in it for our own comfort, our own convenience. We've ignored and killed those who've been sent to us by the landowner as prophets and harvesters. Church, we have been far too long captured by the ways of ownership. You're in and you're out. We must return to that sense of stewardship of creation that the landowner has trusted us with. For we then inherit the true first fruits of the kingdom. Churches all over the world will come to communion tables like the one behind me this Sunday, this morning, and sit at table because Christ has set that table. We in the Presbyterian world call this Sunday peace and global witness. And to enact peace in a global witness, you can't own everything. Well, I have to tell you, we still have a long way to get to peace. We can do this witness of God's authority in our lives, hopefully a little bit more easier, recognizing that we've been given all these things from God. And what we think as terrible news, that we own nothing, is actually liberating. For only as a steward do you inherit the inheritance from God. Peace, love, the first fruits of the kingdom, your identity, the weight is off your shoulder not to possess it. So then let us come to this table that is set behind me, set by Christ, done in love with the authority of heaven and earth. There's no greater authority, friends, than that. And the good news is that you have a place at this table because it is not a table that I set or that covenant sets, or the Presbyterian Church sets, because let's be honest, we would own it, we would possess it. Thankfully, the good news is that Christ, by the authority of heaven and earth, sets this table. And so when we ask the question, who is in charge here? We can simply say Christ. And that is liberating news. And thank God for that good news. So let us go into this world being a steward rather than a wicked tenant. Because, let's be honest, hasn't got us very far, and we keep losing each other one by one. Let us come to the table of grace by the authority of heaven and of earth. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. On World Communion Sunday, we celebrate that Christ's peace extends throughout all creation. We celebrate that we are offered what we need to continue the work of building the household of God with active peacemakers here at home and around the world. We take action today by offering a blessing of our own. Through our participation in the Peace and Global Witness Offering, our church is extending Christ's peace throughout our community. 25% of the gifts received will stay right here at the church to build God's house. 25% will support regional efforts in our mid-councils, and 50%
will go to the Presbyterian Mission Agency for its ministries of education and partnership with active peacemakers all around the world. Peacemakers in places like Cameroon where violence and conflict threaten, peacemakers providing ministries of reconciliation inside prison walls, and peacemakers seeking to eradicate disease like HIV AIDS and their impact on the most vulnerable all gather with us <clears throat> at the table in God's house and greet us saying, the peace of Christ be with you. Please give generously. You can note on your offering through the mail or online that is for the Peace and Global Witness offering. For more blessings than we can imagine, may the Spirit move us to give generously, trusting through the love of Christ. The gifts will be multiplied in ways we cannot measure or control. For the sake of God's kingdom, may we share the blessings of our lives. Please pray with me. We offer these gifts to you, O God, in response to your many gracious gifts to us. Bless and use all that we offer, both these gifts and our lives, as we seek to be followers of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is Christ's table. This table extends beyond these walls, beyond what it looks like to you, into your home, and Christ is preparing for us today. For we believe that when Christ comes to us at this table, this table can sustain us. It can invite us into larger conversations. It can have both enemy and friend sit next to one another. For it is in the kingdom of heaven that this table has given us authority and is authority in our lives. So come, friends, for when Christ was at table with his disciples, he broke bread and then gave it to them, and their eyes were open and they recognized him. So may we, in the breaking of bread, recognize Christ in our midst this morning. So come, for all has been prepared. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. When the hour was late, you spoke, God, and creation sprang forth in newness, and you shaped us in your image. If we had listened to you, we would have feasted on Eden's delights, but we hungered for sin's moldy bread and drank death's sour wine. With great love and unceasing hope, you sent the prophets to us, but we sent them away, for the hour was too early to follow you. Then, in overwhelming compassion, you sent Jesus to us. With those who have been fed by your love, with those who drink deeply of your joy, we lift our songs of thanksgiving to you. Together with all of creation, we sing your majesty. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are gracious and merciful, holy God, and Jesus Christ is your heart made flesh. He who had everything came to fill those who had nothing. He who lived in glory came to the deserted places of our hearts to love us. He who is over all 
came to submit to death's power, being cut off from you until you raise him to new life. We need not go away empty, but are fed at the table where we speak the truth in Christ. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Here at the table, God of abundance, you feed us with that grace and peace which is offered at no cost to us. The Holy Spirit bless the bread, breaks it, and gives it to us so we might have the strength to hold those whose knees wobble from fear and despair. The Holy Spirit blesses the cup, pours it, and gives it to us so we can lift it up, the hopes which the world has dashed to the ground. The Holy Spirit will gather up the broken people to create a community of wholeness. Brothers and sisters, it's appropriate to bring our joys and concerns to God at this table this morning. So keep in your prayers joys, joys of those who work on our worship service every week. For those in the community who give for our emergency food bags and for those who receive them. For people who check in on each other just to say hello during this time. For birthdays and anniversaries. A joy to be back in worship with you all again in ministry and mission from my time away on maternity leave. Also keep in your prayers this morning those who mourn. For Casey Ticknor, a friend of Pete and Terry Reese, who died on Sunday, September 27th, prayers for friends and family. And for Galen Hill, one of our own, who died this past week, prayers for his family and friends and Casey, his true friend here in our, our uh, church, and also the joy class uh, who Galen was a part of, who will miss him dearly. We will after this worship service at 2 p.m. today, lay him to rest. And so return him back to his maker. And so prayers for Casey and for Galen's friends and family. We also pray that uh, Lorinda Murphy, uh, as both her parents are dealing with serious health issues, prayers for her family are needed at this time. For Barbara Browley, who is Joetta Wells' friend who's experiencing health problems. For Johnny Rogers, who's Chuck Manning's uncle, who suffered a stroke and is now permanently blind, we pray for Johnny and his family. For Judy Godert, who would like prayers for her grandchildren, Nicholas and Angelina, and their mother, Maria. They are COVID positive and quarantined in Lubbock. For Robert Loxton, a friend of Mary Donovan, who was in an ATV accident. And for Robert, her husband, who is out of the hospital, continued prayers for healing. For uh, George Blankenship, for Joe Blankenship, who are both dealing with health issues. For Meg Quindinen, Sarah Reed's dearest friend, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. For Kevin Peters, who is home recovering, but always a frustration with insurance and rehab. And we pray for Kevin and Gina and their family. We pray for Mary Ann Donovan as she continues to battle her own health issues. We pray for Jim Landerman, who's fighting cancer. For Serena, a friend of Christina Boss, who has stage 4 cancer. For Patsy Dinamore, who is having health concerns. For Barbara Dinn, as she continues to heal. For Joy, a friend of Ruth Moore, who is home but will have later surgery this year. For Rich Toms and Jim and Mary Louise Ricketts, uh, continued health concerns for them, so prayers for all of them. For the unrest in our nation and our world, for those who will celebrate the World Communion this Sunday, may peace and our global witness to each other be fruitful. Let us continue in prayer. And when the final hour is now, when we are gathered with our sisters and brothers of every time and place, we will eat and be filled at the Lamb's Supper and rejoice with one voice as we praise you forever and ever. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest and betrayal, Jesus was gathered in an upper room with his disciples at supper. He took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying to them, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to take your bread and your cup this morning with juice or water or wine and break your bread, pour your cup, and know that Christ has set this table. Let us pray. Behold, we have experienced a mystery. Ordinary bread and ordinary fruit become for us nourishing life that can transform even the grief and fear of these strange times into hope and love. May it be so not just in this meal, but every meal. And may we who have been fed from these tables go forth to feed others this day and every every day evermore. Amen. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching.
marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching. Ooh, ooh, we are marching in the light of light of God. We are marching. Ooh, ooh, we are marching in the light of God. We are dancing 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 in the light of God. We are dancing. Ooh, ooh, we are dancing in the light of God. We are dancing. Ooh, ooh, we are dancing in the light of God. We are praying 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 in the light of God. We are praying. Ooh, ooh, we are praying in the light of God. We are praying. Ooh, ooh, we are praying in the light of God. We are singing 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 in the light of God. We are singing. Ooh, ooh, we are singing in the light of God. We are singing. Ooh, ooh, we are singing in the light of God. So friends, let us go out this day releasing the authority we believe we have over this world and over each other. Letting Christ be that authority of heaven and earth to nourish our lives at different tables so that we all can enjoy the first fruits of the kingdom, peace and love with one another. And as you go, may you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit always go before you to show you that way. Let us go. Amen.